and that uh, phi of E beta lands in T beta. Um, wait, so that's keeping with the convention from yesterday that alphas are red and betas are blue. Well, that's sort of why I labeled uh, E alpha uh, red and E beta blue. So maybe a, a cartoon picture of what's going on is that you have uh, you have some G, and then you have sitting there. You have uh, T alpha, and you have T beta. Then you have some intersection point, say X, and some intersection point Y, and then maybe it just lands like this. All right. So that's what a Whitney disk is. So we'll let uh, pi 2 from x to y denote the set of homotopy classes. of Whitney disks from x to y. <coughs> Great. So, so far I haven't used anywhere that I'm thinking of this disk as sitting in the complex plane, but that will, that will show up now. So, A choice of uh, complex structure on uh, sigma induces one on sim g. So then uh, we can look at uh, the moduli space. of holomorphic representatives of phi. Um, great and sort of generically, oh, this is going to be a smooth manifold. Um, I don't really want to get into what I mean by generically. Um, Great, so that's going to be a smooth manifold, so we can talk about its uh, dimension. So we'll write uh, mu of phi to denote the expected dimension of m of phi. And then I will also and W of phi, uh, we're going to write this to denote uh, the algebraic intersection number between the image of phi and uh, the subspace VW. Right? This is a, a co-dimension uh, two subspace, so this is going to be um, a set of points. <coughs> Great. What else? Uh, so there's, there's an R action on this moduli space um, c uh, consisting of uh, complex automorphisms uh, that fix plus or minus i. So if, if this expected dimension is 1, well then, OK, we have this R action, so we can quotient by this R action. So let's let m hat uh, denote this quotient 
Um, great, and then if, well, if this, if this dimension is one, will we quotient out by this R action? Well, this is gonna, this quotient's gonna be zero dimensional. Um, and uh, this is gonna, this is a, uh, this here is a compact zero dimensional manifold. So in particular, it's just, this is a set of points, a finite set of points. Okay. So now that I've defined all of those things, well, I'm ready to tell you what this chain complex is. Wait. Okay, so remember uh, CF hat, right? This is uh, generated over F by uh, T alpha into sec. T beta, this is just a set of points. And so now I want to tell you what the boundary map is. Uh, so the boundary of x, so we'll sum over um, all the other generators. And then we'll take the sum over uh, v in pi two from x to y. Uh, we want the um, we want mu of v to be one, and we want n w of v to be zero. And then uh, we'll take right. So uh, this m hat is just a collection of points so we can count them. Uh, I guess we're working over the field of two elements so we'll count them mod two. And then that's gonna be the coefficient of y. Uh, so that's what the boundary map is. Um, so in, in a few minutes we'll look at an example. Um, but that's what the boundary is. Yes, I'm working on, yeah, yeah, so I'm working on two to avoid signs. Um, you, you can do this with signs. Yeah. How are you using expected dimensions? Uh, are we assuming that we're sufficiently generic so that that is the dimension? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Great. Okay, so so far I've defined uh, some map for you. And so uh, we have the following theorem due to Oshroth and Zappo. Great. So, well, I've been claiming this is the differential, so it better square to be zero. Um, great, so d squared is zero. Um, the, the proof of that is that, well, uh, these, point, these points are the ends of a compact one-dimensional manifold, and so, well, there's, if you have a compact one-dimensional manifold, well, that's just the, uh, the boundary of that's gonna be an even number of points, or if you orient everything, it's gonna be with sign, it's gonna be zero points. Uh, so that's the proof that d squared is zero. And then the second part is that, well, this actually gives um, an invariant of the three manifold. So uh, if H is the Hager diagram for Y, uh, then the homology of this chain complex I've just defined is an invariant of Y. So in particular, it doesn't depend on any choices that we made. What choices did we make? We chose the Hager diagram, and then uh, we also made this choice of complex structure. But it turns out uh, it's independent of all of those choices. Ah, yes, yeah, can I define a Z grading? Um, yes, that's the next thing I'm gonna say. Uh, um, great. Uh, it's almost the next thing I'm gonna say. Um, the first thing I'm saying, I, sort of, I already said before, it's that there's a splitting, this chain complex splits along spin C structures, uh, so there's a splitting on the chain level. Um, 
and sort of in the problem session, one of the problems tells you how to uh, partition the generators into different equivalence classes, and then you can see that the differential sort of keeps you within your equivalence class. Wait. And the second is that there is, uh, so first let's define a relative Z grading. Right, so relative Z grading means, just means, oh, we can talk about the difference, the grading difference between two elements, but maybe we can't pin it down absolutely yet. Uh, so if I have two uh, generators and an element uh, phi in pi two from x to y, well, we can define the grading difference between x and y. Uh, so this is just going to be uh, mu of phi minus uh, nw of phi. And you can check um, from this definition of this relative z grading, uh, it's straightforward to verify that the differential lowers the grading by one. Oh, I, I haven't yet. I ha I, so, um, that, that's right, yes, that is correct. Are there questions? <coughs> Great, so we, have, right, so we have this relative Z grading, <coughs> and in fact, um, you can lift it to an absolute grading. So, uh, Z, the relative Z grading uh, can be lifted to an absolute, uh, turns out that it's an absolute uh, Q grading. Um, so how is that done? Well, um, all right, I, I told you that a cobordism between two three manifolds induces a map between um, the Hagar flow homologies. <coughs> and so, um, and in particular, you can sort of understand the grading shift associated to a cobordism map. And so by looking at cobordism maps, uh, together with a normalization, um, you can define this absolute Q grading. So this is uh, from uh, looking at cobordism maps. Um, plus uh, a normalization. So what do I mean by normalization? I just mean that, well, we define the Hager flow homology of S3 to be in a certain grading, and then the cobordism map sort of tells us the gradings for any other three manifold. Well, why is it rational? Oh, why is it rational? That's a good question. Um, yeah. um, I, if, you, if you only care about integer homology spheres, it's always going to be integral. Um. Is there an interpretation in terms of data invariance or some direct like operation? Probably. There's probably someone in the audience that can give a better answer to that than I can. Any takers? No takers. Okay, well, sorry. Great, all right. So let's look at an example. So let's look at the following Hagar diagram. Alphas are red, betas are blue. So we have a, <coughs> all right, so there's a base point somewhere. All right, so I want to look at sim g. Well, here g is one, so sim g just actually, sim g of the surface just is the surface itself. Um, T alpha, well, just is alpha itself. T beta just is beta itself. <coughs> so the Hagar floor chain complex 
uh, CF hat. Well, it's generated by intersection points between T alpha and T beta. There's a single intersection point between them. Uh, so uh, this is just a single copy of F. Um, uh, the differential is zero. I guess maybe the easiest way to see that is, well, uh, the differential lowers grading by one. We only have a single generator. It lives in some grading, so it can't appear in its own differential since the differential lowers grading by one. Great, so differential is zero. Um, so the homology is just isomorphic to F. Um, great, and then this, this normalization that I mentioned um, we normalize this so that this is in grading zero. So that's the Hagerd flow homology of S3. Uh, let's look at another Hagerd diagram for S3. So we'll have, a, uh, again, this alpha circle. And now this will be our beta circle. Uh, let's put our base point W right here. Great. OK. So now we want to, again, look at intersection points between T alpha and T beta. Right, T alpha just is this alpha circle. T beta just is this beta circle. So now we have three intersection points. So the chain complex CF hat, well, it's uh, F cubed, right? It's freely generated over F by the, these intersection points. And now, now we want to compute the Boundary. Great. So we want to look. <coughs> we want to look for appropriate Whitney disks, say from C. So if I want to compute the boundary of C, well, I want a Whitney disk uh, from C to some other generator, and in fact, um, there's one right here. <coughs> and in fact. Um, uh, mu of this is 1, so this is going to contribute to the boundary. Uh, so the boundary of C uh, is, is B. And in fact, you can convince yourself that there's no other Whitney disks from C. So in fact, the boundary of C is exactly B. Great. <laughs> um, now let's think about the boundary of A. So, well, there's this uh, Whitney disk from A to B, right? Um, it's sort of the orientations of the boundary matter. It's sort of that as you leave as you leave A, you should see alpha to your right and beta to your left, and you do. But now, well, what's the problem with this? So remember, in our definition of the boundary, we wanted the, the intersection between the image of the disk and the subspace VW to be 0. So here, since this is genus 1, v, the subspace VW just is the point W. Um, and there's, well, and the image of this disk has non-zero intersection number with the base point W, so this doesn't count. So this is 0. Right? You, you might think that the boundary of A should be B, but because this base point sat inside of the image of that disk, it's 0. Uh, so this is since uh, NW of the phi I drew is non-zero. <coughs> Great. Um, and then you can also uh, check that the boundary of B is 0. Great. Uh, so that's the boundary. And then, well, if you, can, if you compute the homology of this, Um, well, OK, it better agree with the calculation over there. And indeed, it does, right? Um, explicitly, well, the uh, kernel is generated by A and B, uh, but B is in the image. All right, so that's uh, CF hat. 
And CF minus is defined very similarly. So CF minus is freely generated over the ring F of join U by, again, by points in T alpha intersect T beta. And so now, well, let me tell you what the boundary map is. OK, so it's going to look very familiar. Uh, it's almost the same as before. Uh, so again, uh, sum over phi and pi 2 from x to y. Again, you want mu of phi to be 1. Again, you look at the number of points in m hat of phi. But now, now we do something different with the base point. And that's where we use this formal variable u. Uh, now we put u to the n w of phi. So whereas in the definition for the boundary on CF hat, we require that n w of phi be 0, well, now, now we allow this to be non-zero, but and we just set that as the exponent of, of u. Great, and then we again have the uh, Theorem due to Ajvath and Zabo that uh, d squared is zero and that the chain homotopy type of this chain complex is independent of the choices that you made. So independent of your choice of Hager diagram and choice of complex structure. So I want to, wait, so let's, let's end by computing hf minus of S3 and let's do it Great, so if you do it from this diagram, well, CF minus is just F join U, and the boundary is zero, so HF minus is F join U, where um, we normalize our grading, so one is in grading zero. <coughs> and now if we were to compute that from this Hagar diagram, um, so, CF minus, well, we have three generators, so this is going to be uh, F join U plus F join U plus F join U. And now, well, the boundary, um, great, so now, now the boundary of A, well, now, now it's okay for our disks to cross the base point, where we just record that with the power of u. So over here, where the boundary of A was zero, well, now, now it's going to be u times b, exactly because of this disk right here that crossed the base point. And uh, boundary of b is still zero, and boundary of c is still b. <coughs> so if you were to compute the homology of this, Um, great, well, this is F of join U if you want to explicitly. Uh, so what's in the kernel? B is in the kernel. And then also, if you take uh, A plus UB, that's in the kernel. And then uh, I guess when I'm writing this, I'm writing this being gener uh, generated over F of join U. And so then the image. Uh, is B, right? And so, well then, uh, the homology is isomorphic to F or join U, thought of as being generated by uh, A plus UB. Great, so I'll stop there. <laughs>